Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our online event. For those who don't know me, I am Maria Kaliambu, Senior Lector at the Hellenic Studies Program at Macmillan Center at Yale University. As uh, you may all know, this year marks the bicentennial anniversary of the Greek Revolution, the struggle against the Ottoman Empire. The Hellenic Studies Program celebrates and commemorates this anniversary with the series of lectures, the Greek Revolution across the globe. We started our series at the beginning of this month with a talk by Professor Buskovic on the Decembrist revolt in Russia and the Greek Revolution. Today, we are hosting a promising talk on American Philhellenism and the influence of the Greek Revolution of 1821 to the US. Also, let me take this opportunity to announce a conference I'm organizing for the fall with the topic, the Greek Revolution and Greek diaspora in North America. The symposium will focus on the historical and cultural impact of the Greek Revolution for the Greeks in the United States and Canada, and it will discuss its contemporary significance in the identity formation of those communities. And please stay tuned for further, further events in the fall. The series will continue. So now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce you Professor Maureen Connors Santelli. Maureen Santelli is a Montana native. She attended the University of Montana in Missoula, where she earned undergraduate degrees in history and classics. Santelli's combined interests in ancient Greece, Rome, and early American history inspired her research as a graduate student at George Mason University, where she completed her, her master's and PhD. Santelli has completed fellowships at George Washington's Mount Vernon, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the Library Company of Philadelphia. She also has worked with the National Park Service as an interpreter and historian. Currently, she's an associate professor in Northern Virginia Community College. Professor Santelli has published an article with Early American Studies, an interdisciplinary journal with the title, Depart from that retired circle, women's support of the Greek war for independence and antebellum reform. Her recent book, The Greek Fire, American Ottoman Relations and Democratic Fervor in the Age of Revolutions, which is the title and the topic of her talk today, examines the rise of Philhellenism in the United States and how the movement influenced both foreign and domestic policies during the early American Republic. And please let me mention that her book is recently translated in Greek with the title American Philhellenism and the Influence of the Greek Revolution of 1821 to the US. And it was released just a few days before the national official commemorations of the bicentennial of the revolution, a few days before March 25th. The Greek book has a prologue by the American ambassador in Greece, Mr. Geoffrey Payat. And there are already excellent reviews in Greek online journals and newspapers. So congratulations for your new book, Professor Santelli. Before I give the floor to our speaker, I would like to remind to our audience that you can submit your questions to the Q&A section. The chat function does not uh, work for today. It's, um, we have, um, um, uh, we, we don't have it in use. So, so that it doesn't disrupt the flow of the conversation. And all your questions will be answered after uh, the lecture. So without further ado, Professor Santelli, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you and thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking to uh, the webinar about this. Um, today, what I am going to focus especially on is the influence of the Greek Revolution and the legacy of the revolution on uh, the abolitionist movement in the United States. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here because I have images that I want to refer to throughout this. So there we go. Okay, there we go. So where I wanna begin is with a quote. Um, spoken by an abolitionist, and it's his take on the uh, Philhellen and abolitionist Samuel Gridley Howe. 
Um, Samuel, Samuel Gridley Howe, of course, um, gets his start um, in his humanitarian efforts, uh, in his involvement in the Greek army. He had been a, a recent graduate of medical school in the uh, early 1820s. He uh, wants to support the Greeks, but also gain some uh, medical experience on the battlefield. So he leaves the United States and travels to Greece and is there operating within the Greek army, but he also served as an agent for American Philhellenic groups um, traveling between the US and Greece on several occasions in order to convey news about uh, the, the progress of the revolution, to bring supplies, to inform the American people on what was needed. So he's very much a part of the humanitarian effort. He also um, later in life uh, is, a, is a devoted humanitarian and philanthropist, and he was very much a part of the abolitionist movement, and, he, and in fact was, was quite a radical within the abolitionist movement. Um, he is depicted here on your screen on the right. I try, whenever I show images, I like to use images um, of the individuals close to uh, how they might have looked when I'm speaking about them. Because a lot of the times if the 19th century end up with images of them um, quite old uh, and not at all what they would have looked like in their youth. So I, I, I tried my best to pull, pull up a, an image of Samuel Gridley Howe. So here he is um, uh, uh, portrayed in the Greek army. Now his friend, Franklin Benjamin Sanborn um, is depicted here on the left. He wrote the preface to his uh, good friend's um, uh, journal and uh, diary entries um, in the early 20th century. And, um, and he, had, he had some things to say about Howe's involvement in the abolitionist movement and the origins of it. So Franklin Benjamin Sanborn was a school teacher from Concord, Massachusetts in 1857 when he was especially involved with uh, Samuel Grilly Howe. And uh, the two men had, jo had joined a radical abolitionist group devoted to raising funds in support of John Brown and other anti-slavery residents of Kansas. Now, John Brown recently has made it uh, made an appearance more in pop culture. He's the subject of uh, the book and movie, The, the Good Lord Bird. Uh, John Brown was uh, absolutely a radical abolitionist involved in uh, the, uh, in, the insurrection in Kansas. Uh, there's a question over whether Kansas would become a slave or free state. And then he later is involved in efforts to raise funds to uh, basically participate in a slave insurrection in what was then Harper's Ferry, Virginia. So um, uh, Howe and his friend Sanborn here were involved in a particularly secret group with the, the so-called Secret Six. Um, and they were devoted to raising funds to support John Brown's attempted slave insurrection. Now, uh, through the, uh, Brown slave insurrection, or though, excuse me, though Brown slave insurrection is going to be suppressed almost immediately, the event further exacerbated sectional tensions between the North and South, and Sanborn is forever going to be associated with this climatic event, which ultimately paved the way towards civil war. Decades later, Sanborn is going to write the preface and notes for the collected journals and uh, letters of Samuel Gridley Howe. Sanborn praised his friend for his role in the emancipation of Greece and later within the United States. Howe was a born philanthropist, observed Sanborn, and well aware that the service of mankind often requires political revolutions. Sanborn went on to state that Howe's devotion to the anti-slavery cause in the 19th century had begun in Greece and culminated in our American Civil War. Reflecting on the legacy of the Greek Revolution and the aftermath of the Civil War from the vantage point of the early 20th century, Sanborn viewed the progress toward abolition in the United States from a global perspective. To Sanborn, at least, the abolition of slavery in the United States could not have been accomplished without the influence of the Greek War for Independence. The Greek Revolution drew the attention of most early Americans beginning in 1821. 
At first inspired by a transatlantic phenomenon known as the Philhellenic movement, many Europeans and Americans supported the prospect of a Greek nation. Early Americans imagined themselves to be politically and ideologically connected with ancient Greece and wished to release the modern Greeks from the Ottoman Empire. Now, this perception of uh, early American connections with Greece um, was born initially in the late 18th century. Um, we have to remember that Americans coming out of the American Revolution are trying to divorce themselves from their Britishness. They want to distance themselves from that identity. So um, Americans of the 18th century tried to essentially adopt a new identity and they associated themselves with, at that time anyway, the Roman Republic. Over time, over the, the next couple of decades, slowly but surely we start to see Americans more and more embracing a Greek influence in American culture. And this is partly because of the rising uh, democratic fervor uh, leading up to the 1820s, this leads to what early Americanists refer to as the Jacksonian period. This is the period of Andrew Jackson, where we start to see universal white male suffrage uh, becoming commonplace across the state. So it's, it's, it's kind of the, the era of the common man, if you will. And uh, there is this overall in, embracement of the origins of ancient democracy and that connection in the United States. Phil Hellens joined efforts with benevolence and missionary groups and together they promoted humanitarianism, education reform, and evangelism. Now, benevolence groups in the United States at this time are often closely associated with uh, church groups. So they have this kind of interconnection with missionary groups at that time. Um, a lot of the times these are uh, female led groups, but not always, but women certainly were involved in uh, these local outreach groups. It's about, you know, raising charitable funds for, you know, like perhaps orphans, uh, destitute women, that sort of thing. And it was appropriate for women to be involved in those sorts of outreach groups because it was considered to be part of the so-called domestic sphere. So things that had to do with the home caring for children, what have you, was acceptable for women to be involved in. And um, the Philhellenic movement poses this moment for women where they can be involved in an interna international outreach for humanitarian aid because there are women and children in need in Greece. So it, it was a sort of natural step there uh, for these women. And indeed, uh, the efforts at supporting Greece as a humanitarian effort is one of the first humanitarian efforts that we see in um, US history. The redemption of the Greeks by various pro-Greek organizations assumed a secularized missionary spirit, um, which endeavored to spread an American understanding of freedom, liberty, and Christianity to all parts of the world. Greek relief efforts were led by the classical scholar and philanthropist Edward Everett, and was supported by countless community groups throughout the country. Long after the Greek Revolution had ended in 1832, the ideas and tactics of the Philhellenic movement contributed to the growing momentum of the American abolitionist movement. Before abolitionism became a popular movement in the United States, many early Americans viewed slavery as an extension or as it existed in the Muslim world to be abhorrent. So how they're approaching their perception of the, of the Greek revolution is absolutely linked with their perception of the Ottoman Empire at that time. The popularity of captivity tales, which describe the experiences Westerners had as captives in the Muslim world, informed and sustained negative feelings toward the Ottoman Empire and, and Muslims in general, quite frankly. Uh, captivity tales were probably, um, one of the most common and popular genres in early America. Uh, some of these captivity tales were written um, by, uh, by the people who actually experienced uh, the, their captivity. It usually was the Barbary States in North Africa. Uh, some of these are fictionalized though as well. But ultimately, this is the, the lens through which Americans view the Ottoman empires through these captivity tales. African-American publications referenced the Greek cause with frustration and appealed to their readers 
to recognize the similarities between the life of a Greek under Ottoman rule and the life of an African slave under Southern, a Southern master's rule. Several articles were published in the first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, at the height of the Greek cause's popularity. With reference to the Greek cause, one author pointed out, it would be instructive to take any of the addresses, speeches, or resolutions made on that occasion and to see how many of the most odious features of Turkish slavery may be fairly matched in this free and enlightened country. So they're starting to ask themselves, um, you know, how is it that Americans are so um, shocked and horrified at the enslavement of the Greeks and in that moment, and yet somehow people are fine with the existence of slavery within their own borders. Something can be learned from this. Let's try and use Philhellenic rhetoric for our own purpose and see if we can get any momentum out of that. The author continued with their own comparison between slavery in Greece and America, included that given the amount of support the Greeks had recently enjoyed, what generous mind would not rather be Greek than the Black? Another article written more than a year later observed, in the midst of these nations who call themselves the friends of liberty and humanity, involuntary servitude is justified while it is even a problem of whether the understanding of Negroes be the same species of that of white men. Still another example of an African-American abolitionist using the Greek cause as a rhetorical tool was David Walker who was a, um, a, a free African-American, but uh, he was a radical proponent for the uh, immediatist uh, movement that emerged in the late 1820s. This was a departure from the gradual emancipation perspective, um, meaning uh, you know, like gradually emancipating slaves. Usually this, if they, once they reached a certain age, they would be emancipated. By the late 1820s, we see a turn for the radical in the abolitionist movement where they're tired of waiting. They're tired of this, this you know, gradual emancipation stuff. Um, slavery, if slavery is wrong, and indeed it's wrong, it needs to be ended right now. And uh, again, David Walker was associated with this more radical uh, shift in the late 1820s. So printed in 1829, Walker's radical pamphlet, and this is the front piece to this, uh, the appeal to the colored citizens of the world rallied both free and enslaved African Americans to stand up to the institution of slavery. Walker poignantly observed, and this is where he does his, uh, the, the connection with the Philhellenic movement and uh, slavery as it existed in the South. He observed that while reading a South Carolina newspaper, he came across an article stating, the Turks are the most bar barbarous people in the world. They treat the Greeks more like brutes than human beings. But then right next to that article, uh, there was an advertisement that said, eight well-built Virginia and Maryland Negro fellows and four wenches will positively be sold this day to the highest bidder. For Walker, the disconnect between condemning a foreign institution of slavery and while supporting a domestic one was unpalatable. Walker concluded by directing his arguments toward white Americans and warned that they could not hide their hypocrisy from God, even though you can hide it from the rest of the world by sending out missionaries and by your charitable deeds to the Greeks. Contrasting popular interest in Greece with the lack of interest in the issue of American slavery proved to make for a powerful comparison. If the Turks were indeed barbaric for holding slaves, what made American slaveholders so different? For Walker and others, racial differences did not provide sufficient, sufficient justification. If Americans could see the similarity between the Greeks and African slaves, then it would be clear that the institution itself was the problem, not the racial characteristics of the slaves. Perhaps the most famous white abolitionist of the antebellum era was made, uh, almost made his hum humanitarian debut as an American Philhellenic soldier. And this is William Lloyd Garrison. Here he is in 1833 as a, a young man in his 20s. So uh, William Lloyd Garrison, when he was just 20 years old, 
uh, when the Greek cause in America was at its height of popularity. Um, he was caught up in the pro-Greek fervor and like many other youths of the time, aspired to defend the Greeks by joining the Greek army. Although the budding abolitionist ultimately decided not to join the Greek forces, his Philhellenic rhetoric, however, stayed with him throughout his life. For example, in 1831, Garrison openly accused his countrymen of being hypocrites for supporting the Greeks while forsaking the African slaves. In a piece titled The Insurrection, which was printed in Garrison's publication, The Liberator, Garrison reprimanded his contemporaries who feared slave insurrection and flatly stated that African slaves did not need to be pushed into insurrection by abolitionist influence. Instead, they could find incentive in their stripes, in their emaciated bodies, in their ceaseless toil. Garrison continued his accusation of hypocrisy by pointing out that most Americans had applauded the Greek insurrection and observed that African slaves deserve no more censure than the Greeks. Garrison's writing, especially his insurrection article, created controversy wherever it was printed, in both in the North and South. Uh, one Portsmouth, Maine newspaper reported that North Carolinians were especially up in arms, depending in eight, demanding in 1831 that anyone who circulated the Liberator, and again, this is Garrison's uh, newspaper, ought to be barbecued. And it was the growing Southern belief that the distribution of abolitionist uh, literature was going to pave the way towards insurrection. So uh, they, they, they banned abolitionist newspapers and pamphlets. And this is where we start to see laws passed forbidding uh, teaching African uh, slaves to read and write. The Portsmouth Journal made a similar historical connection as Garrison had with the Greek Revolution, pointing out that if the liberator would incite insurrection in the South, then the North Carolina free press should also stop publishing pieces about liberty and equality and rejoicing at the success of the Greeks. So again, here we see that connection. Something had changed. When the Greek revolution first began in 1821, Americans had seldom connected the abolition of Greek slavery with the condition of slavery in the United States. Citizens of the American South rejected any link between the plight of the Greeks and that of their own slaves. The spreading desire for freedom would eventually come to the American South, predicted um, abolitionist newspapers, and African slaves would, like their Greek counterparts, rebel. The national consensus behind supporting the Greek cause was becoming a distant memory by the 1830s and was instead joining with the divisive political rhetoric of the antebellum era. To recall the tyranny of the Turks was to summon the ultimate definition of despotism in the contemporary world for early Americans. The Greek cause became a part of a reformist legacy, linking the progression of this antebellum reform movement to a global story rather than just a domestic one. An important way in which the rhetoric of the Philhellenic movement was adopted by abolitionist groups was through the unveiling of Hiram Power's statue, The Greek Slave. Anticipated for two years, Power's masterpiece finally arrived in New York in August of 1847. Now, Hiram Powers was uh, an American artist, although he was primarily trained in Europe. The Greek Slave was created in Europe and then uh, with much fanfare, arrives for a national tour in New York City in 1847. So here it is in this image um, at the uh, Dusseldorf Gallery in New York. And as you can see, um, it is uh, being viewed literally by the public. Uh, we have not just men um, out in public viewing the statue, but we have women and children. Um, and uh, this was the first nude statue to be accepted by the American public in part because of its subject matter. Um, it depicted a young Christian girl a uh, Greek girl on a Turkish auction block. The statue toured the United States and was viewed by thousands of Americans, both male and female. Um, this is gonna stimulate social debate wherever it went. The work compelled many Americans to recall their support for the Greek revolution, their disdain for Ottoman slavery 
and the status of women both at home and abroad. And that's actually another topic I take up in my book as well, the inspiration that the Greek slave has on the birth of the women's rights movement, which emerges in the late 1840s. The image of the Greek slave could no longer inspire unity in the American Philhellenic movement um, as it had in the 1820s, but rather now it represented the feelings of political and sectional division that plagued the United States of this time. For many Americans, the Greek slave did not merely conjure an image of the Greek Revolution and the struggles of innocent civilians. The Greek slave stood as an idealized symbol of freedom an image that highlighted the degree to which American society fell short of that ideal. Frederick Douglass's paper, so he, Frederick Douglass uh, even at this time has, has this uh, budding newspaper, and it captured this sentiment best. In a review, the author described the statue in, a, in great detail and offered an emotional reaction to seeing the innocent young girl in chains. So um, uh, just to, for, to take a second here, uh, this is uh, Frederick Douglass uh, photographed in 1847. So this is right at about the same time that the Greek slave arrives in New York City. So as you can see, he, he is a young man um, and again, very much a uh, front and center in the abolitionist, abolitionist movement at this time. So here's what the review had to say about the Greek slave. How heart and brain burn with hatred for the cruel Turk who does thus violate the sacred rights of human nature. And to this feeling heart and discerning eye, all slave girls are Greek and all slave mongers Turks. Their country, Algiers or Alabama, Congo or Carolina, the same. The North Star Review concluded that such was the power of viewing the Greek slave that had Congress appropriated 10 millions of dollars to buy this silent moral mentor and given it a place in the halls where so much crime has been legalized and connived at, ours would have been a wiser and better nation. Many Americans saw in the statue, not just the plight of a young Greek uh, uh, woman, but a larger injustice. If the owner of this young Greek girl was, a cruel, was cruel and despotic, then so too was any individual who stole away the innocence and freedom of another. There were many other reviews of the Greek slave that echoed similar sentiments. Another anti-slavery publication reviewed Power's statue and observed that in so doing, a yet deeper moral is there. For Americans, it is an impersonification of slavery. This creature exhibited for sale in the slave market is a counterpart of thousands of living women. Every day does our own sister city of New Orleans witness similar exposures with a similar purpose. The author of the article concluded with the hope, would that the Greek slave as she passes through the various portions of our country might be endowed with power to teach, to arouse, to purify public opinion. Yet another publication printed in their review that the statue of uh, that, I'm sorry, that the, while the statue of powers enchants the world, there were fair breasts that heaved with genuine sympathy beneath magic, uh, the magic power of the great artist that have never yet breathed a sigh for the sable sisterhood of the South. May many a mother and daughter of the public be awakened to a sense of the enormity of slavery as it exists in our midst. These reviews clearly indicate that for many Americans who flocked to see the Greek slave, they not only saw the statue as a beautiful work of art, or, uh, but also as this political statement against slavery and the Ottoman Empire and an indictment against slavery as it existed in the United States. Some anti-slavery advocates in the United States even argued that a slave's condition was better within the Ottoman Empire than in their own country. It is important to note that by the time the statue was unveiled in the United States, parts of the Ottoman Empire had begun to limit and even outlaw the enslavement of certain groups of people. Americans were aware of this and condemned the United States for not taking similar measures. One newspaper commented on this irony, given the popularity of the Greek slave, stating, it brings home to us the foulest feature of our national sin, 
and the still more humiliating fact that while the accursed system from which it springs has well nigh ceased in Mohammedan countries, it still taints a portion of our Christian soil and is at this very moment clamoring that it may, it may pollute yet more. Like abolitionists of the late 1820s using popular philhellenic rhetoric to advance their arguments, power statue now served a similar purpose. What is clear is that mid-century abolitionists recognized that after several years of national notoriety and fame, the Greek slave could serve as a powerful point of contrast and comparison between the United States and the Ottoman Empire. Most African, or excuse me, most American Southerners did not see the relevance of connecting the Greek slave with slavery as it existed in the US. Many Southern newspapers reported to their readers the progression of the Greek slaves' travels through the US, the reactions that the statue inspired from locals, and the hope for its continued success. There's just no indication in these sources that they uh, are even going to acknowledge the comparison, let alone that they get it. The Southern Patriot, so this is a Southern newspaper, printed a series of articles from the time of the statue's arrival in New York in August 1847, each declaring that the statue had safely arrived in the United States and that it was to be put on public display immediately. Yet another Southern newspaper reported on the reception power statue had enjoyed regarding it as a splendid specimen of American art. The Mississippi Free Trader reported on the arrival of the statue in Natchez in 1851, stating that we are confident locals will crowd the rooms to see the life-size form of the manacled maiden so intense in passion and apparent mental suffering as to make the cold marble appeal to the human heart as forcibly as if her tears and voice were palpable, uh, palpable to the senses. So in fact, in October 1847, at the request of the New, New, Orleans, uh, New Orleans doctor, the Greek slave owned at the time by Power's close friend, Minor Kellogg, was used as a means for raising funds to benefit the sufferers by the pestilence in New Orleans. There's this uh, disease that was running rampant in New Orleans at the time. That many Southerners saw the Greek slave as a beacon of hope and an example of unparalleled art by an American artist is undeniable. Whether they saw a connection to power statue and slavery as it existed within the South is doubtful. At least any reviews printed in Southern newspapers and magazines remain silent on the subject. Some reviews printed by abolitionist publications declared their hope that with the statues traveled throughout the American South, it would change the hearts of slaveholders who looked upon the statue. One such article printed by the National Era, this is an abolitionist uh, leading paper, speculated what impression, and what impression they hoped the Greek slave might have on uh, a slaveholder from St. Louis. Um, so here's what they, their hope is. Um, and this is from the perspective of the slaveholder. I am gazing upon an image as white as the driven snow and in view of the wrongs of the kind she represents, contemplating the complete emancipation of all the white people of the earth under the genial influence of Christianity. And I cannot have my thoughts perturbed by the intrusion of such black and thick lipped images to these I see flitting before my eyes of imagination. Away, away. I came not to think of ebony maidens or men or what humanity requires for them, but to be regaled with the elevating and humanizing sentiments which I dreamed this image should inspire me with. The reviewer fantasized that the Greek slave might turn on its pedestal and actually speak to the slaveholder and say, why limit your sympathies? I was carved from Parian rather than from ebony that I might more effectually appeal to perverted justice and partial sympathy, but I am the representation of the captive and the forsaken everywhere. And whatever sympathy I may secure for my enslaved sisters in Turkey are due to my sisters of another hue in the land throughout which I make my pilgrimage. 
as is clear, clearly made in the National Review or National Era Review. The comparison between the Greek slave and slavery within the US was the obvious one. But the comparison was invalid in the Southern mind. The defense of slavery in the American South was part of a longstanding tradition that had been, become solidified by the Missouri crisis of 1820 and was a foundational part of the Southern way of life. Pro-slavery arguments only became more intensified by the 1830s as Northern abolitionist societies increasingly began publishing indictments against slavery in publications such as William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. So what we have here on the, the screen is a page from uh, a book uh, called From Types of Mankind, uh, printed in 1854. And this is again, roughly about the time the Greek slaves wrapping up its tour. Um, this is a work that uh, equates the white race with uh, perfection and beauty and um, African races as more closely associated with apes. And uh, what we see here in the image is uh, the, the perception of perfection is not so much to like say uh, white Americans, but the ultimate perfection is equated with Greek statuary. So we have uh, the Apollo Belvedere here as the example of perfection of the white race and what humanity should look like. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Apollo Belvedere, I have that here in detail as well. Um, so uh, for Southerners, the enslavement of whites is unacceptable. And that's why like captivity tales and what have you of the enslavement of white Americans was so abhorrent to them. And that's their association with slavery in the Ottoman Empire. They don't see the same link at, with the enslavement of African Americans. To them, it is a completely separate thing. Um, and here we see that the differences in their mind laid bare in a very racist sort of way, of course. In addition to the Greek slave um, was thought of as a white woman about to be sold into slavery to, pres uh, to presumably a non-white male, uh, by condemning the enslavement of whites in the world, Southerners could simultaneously defend a global concept of freedom while still defending black slavery at home. This racial Hellenism, as one historian has called it, must also therefore be understood when considering Southern reactions to power's Greek slave. From the Southern perspective, white Americans shared not only a cultural link to antiqu antiquity with the Greeks, but also whiteness. Greek enslavement was therefore unnatural to in the minds of American Southerners. Rather than change the hearts and minds of slaveholders, as was hoped by the National Era reporter that I just uh, uh, read a, a moment ago, the article would have only been viewed as a challenge to Southern liberty and an insult to their honor. So those articles, and by the way, and that's just one example, there were lots printed, this, this secret hope that the abolitionist, abolitionist, eh, abolitionists had that the Greek slave was going to inspire this huge about face and their perspective on slavery. And it, it just, it, it not only did not resonate with American uh, Southerners, but it, it would have just been more evidence of uh, this insult that abolitionists, abolitionists were lobbing their way. British subjects also speculated what impact, if any, the Greek slave might have on the persistence of slavery in the United States, or at least noted the hypocrisy of its continuation. In 1851, a copy of the Greek slave was sent to England to appear in the Crystal Palace exhibition. The Greek slave influenced John Tenniel's cartoon printed in the British periodical Punch, which uh, you see here on the left. The cartoon was titled The Virginia Slave and depicted a nude African woman standing in a similar way to Power's work of art. Draped over the post to which the Virginia slave was chained was an American flag. At the base of the statue are the words E Pluribus Unum. They're clearly chiseled here. This is, of course, the motto of the United States from many one. So and it is blatantly obvious what connection we're supposed to be getting here. 
Tennille's critique received um, uh, even more notoriety when a fugitive American slave attended the exhibition with the purpose of making an anti-slavery demonstration in the presence of the Greek slave. And this was not uncommon. Um, uh, slaves, once they escaped to the North, they weren't safe in Northern states in the 1850s because of the fugitive slave law, which had been passed in 1850. So many of these slaves fled to Canada and some even made their way abroad uh, to England. And this, as is the case with this particular uh, runaway. Um, when he arrived, the fugitive placed a copy of the Virginia slave near the Greek slave stating as an American fugitive slave, I place this Virginia slave by the side of the Greek slave as its most fitting companion. British anti-slavery uh, society circles, like their American counterparts, criticized American enthusiasm for power statue. Members of the anti-slavery society of London who viewed the Greek slave at the Crystal Palace were especially disgusted. Um, and just really quickly, the Greek slave was uh, put on display in the American exhibit. So the Crystal Palace exhibition was meant to uh, celebrate human progress, especially of the industrialized world. Um, Britain didn't have the only exhibits there. There were exhibits from all around the world. So the United States had their own exhibit there. Uh, members of the, oh, I'm sorry, one member of the uh, London Anti-Slavery Society named Reverend Thomas Bloney observed that the Americans who visited the exhibit must have been struck with a sort of judicial blindness in the selection. In choosing the Greek slave to represent the United States and American artists, it exhibited the worst taste possible, especially given that in addition to this, they also place a man with a stick to turn it, precisely as they would do were they trafficking in human sinew and bone. So um, apparently when you went to this uh, exhibit, there was uh, somebody actually there who uh, turned the Greek slave on a pedestal so that you could see the full 360 view of the statue. Um, so they're, they're equating that uh, again to uh, the slave market. As was the case when Northerners critiqued Southerners, when the British brought up slavery and its persistence in, persistence in the US, it usually only further entrenched slavery as supposedly peculiar aspect to life in the American South. While the Greek slave did not change many Southern minds, if any, uh, it was certainly adopted into abolitionist rhetoric and aided in the intensification of their arguments. In the years leading up to the American Civil War, the legacy of the Philhellenic movement continued to play a part in sectional politics. This legacy is evident in Senator Charles Sumner's White Slavery in the Barbary States, published in 1853. Uh, Charles Sumner was perhaps one of the most outspoken abolitionists um, in Congress, in the Senate. Uh, this is going to eventually translate into a very violent episode that took place on the Senate floor where Charles Sumner um, the day before had spoken out against um, a slave holding in the South and he was attacked by a, a, a slaveholder from the House of Representatives in what's known as the caning of Charles Sumner. So again, Charles Sumner was a very outspoken and well-known abolitionist. And he writes this history of white slavery in the Barbary states. While the, while the title indicates the work was intended to be a history of, the, of slavery in the Barbary states, the anti-slavery sympathizer repeatedly used Turkish slavery as a comparison to slavery in the American South. By referring to the South as the Barbary states of America, Sumner offered a multitude of points of comparison to the Barbary states, including that Virginia, Carolina, Mississippi, and Texas should be the American complement to Morocco, Algiers, Tripoli, and Tunis. In addition, the Barbary states occupy nearly the same parallels with the slave states of our union. With the slaves' long catalog of humiliation and woes not yet complete, 
Sumner's history of the Barbary States illustrated that the system of slavery Phil Hollens had so reviled decades earlier was really not dissimilar from to the system that they themselves uh, allowed to continue within their own borders. Some refugees from Greece made their case, made the case themselves that Greek and African American enslavement was the same issue, giving the American abolitionist movement an expanded international perspective. At least three active members of the abolitionist movement, Photius Fisk, John Zakos, and Joseph Stefanini were Greek youths rescued by American Philhellens and brought to the United States. And unfortunately, I, there isn't an image of Joseph, Joseph Stefanini, and there aren't any images of these, uh, of these men when they were young, first brought over from Greece. Um, so this is, of course, them uh, later in life when they are active in the abolitionist movement. Joseph Stefanini believed he had a unique perspective on the subject, given that he had experienced Ottoman slavery firsthand. Ottoman soldiers captured Stefanini while his village was under attack early on in the war. For several years, he lived as a captive, not knowing whether he would ever see his family again. Through a series of fortunate events, Stefanini managed to escape his captors and gain passage on an American ship bound for New York. Arriving in New York, Stefanini was taken under the wing of the New York Greek Committee. Now, in the United States, these Philhellenic societies um, were found throughout the country, although because the northern states were more urban in nature, we do see uh, larger Philhellenic societies in cities like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, but there were uh, you know, societies everywhere. Um, New York's Greek Committee becomes recognized as the national collection point. So Philhellenic societies nationwide would collect on the local level and then would send their proceeds to New York. So New York was kind of the, uh, the, the collection point, if you will. And uh, they certainly would have had the funds to take uh, someone like Stefanini under their wing. The group granted him passage on a ship um, it was sending back to the Mediterranean, stocked with relief itself for the suffering Greeks. Stefanini became a Greek committee representative of sorts. Almost immediately, he returned to the United States on another American ship, carrying correspondence for the Greek committee in Boston. On the second visit to the United States, Stefanini remained for several years, visiting supporters of the Greek cause in Charleston, South Carolina. It was on this visit to a Southern slaveholding state that Stefanini saw for himself the American institution of slavery. The former Greek slave attempted to keep his language uncontroversial by observing how much he admired America for their assistance to the Greek cause. He concluded his memoir, however, by referring to African slavery stating, the emancipation of a family from the miseries of slavery a slavery of whose horrors I can speak from bitter experience is an enterprise which such a people I confidently trust will not refuse to aid. Stefanini's memoir written and sold specifically to raise money to help him return to Greece to find his enslaved family concluded on an abolitionist note. Given his understanding of Americans and their dedication to Greek freedom, he believed that the American people would be moved to eradicate slavery from their borders. Stefanini was a young, poor refugee who just a few years earlier had not been able to speak a word of English. There are questions about how much of his memoir uh, were actually written by him. Nonetheless, the young Greek achieved national fame. Through the help of Philhellens in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, he traveled throughout the United States Several newspapers reported on these travels. The Vermont Gazette printed that while unwilling to accept charity, Stefanini intended to publish a memoir that would help to raise ransom money to free his mother and sisters. The whole effort would be done in Charleston with the assistance of an unnamed South Carolinian. Published in 1829, Stefanini's memoir was advertised as being a true story, no doubt intended to aid in selling more copies. To say the memoir was a true story was not enough though. Following the preface, 
several well-known American men included letters of introduction for the young Greek refugee. The only South Carolinian who wrote a letter for the book or was thanked by Stefanini in his conclusion was Thomas S. Grimke. Thomas S. Grimke was the son of a wealthy South Carolina slaveholder and the brother of Sarah and Angelina Grimke, both of whom would emerge as outspoken advocates of the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s. Thomas Grimke was a respected lawyer, as well as philanthropist, serving as a member of the American Colonization Society and the American Peace Society. Now, the American Colonization Society was an abolitionist society. Uh, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, was a supporter of the colonization movement. This movement was meant to answer some of the concerns that people had about immediately ending slavery, like what jobs are these freed slaves gonna have? Where are they gonna go? The American colonization movement was about sending uh, these freed slaves uh, to Africa in a newly created um, uh, co country, really, Liberia. Um, capital city was Monrovia, actually. Um, Grimke was not specifically named as the South, South Carolinian who assisted Stefanini in editing the manuscript. However, Grimke had at least some input. His letter of introduction for the memoir stated that he had examined Stefanini's letters and therefore recommended him with great pleasure to all who feel sympathy for his personal misfortunes. Joseph Stefanini managed to collect enough proceeds for his, from his memoir to leave the US and return to Greece. So um, my argument here is that Stefanini, although he's trying to play things neutral by not openly declaring you know, like I'm being financially supported by an abolitionist group, he has linked himself with known advocates of the abolitionist movement. So um, he wants to, to sell this uh, memoir nationwide, but if you read between the lines, it, it's just unmistakable that he is, is linking himself with the abolitionist movement. Other Greek refugees who arrived in the United States permanently claimed it as their new home. These Greek refugees were mere children when they came to America to receive an education sponsored by local Greek committees. Though they became American citizens, Bodius Fisk and John Zakos carried their experiences from the Greek revolution into adulthood. Photius Fisk came to the United States under the sponsorship of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, as well as Philhellenic Americans. With a brother in the Greek army, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. With a brother in the Greek army, Fisk from an early age learned to detest every form of slavery. Fisk later became an ordained minister and was named a chaplain in the US Navy in 1841. Throughout his life's work for the abolition of slavery and other philanthropic causes, admirers of Photius Fisk recognized the connection between his devotion to the anti-slavery movement and his experiences with the wrongs imposed upon the people of his country by the Turkish tyrants. Fisk became well acquainted with, with William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and Frederick Douglass, and many other members of the anti-slavery movement. Perhaps the most noteworthy was John Brown. Uh, John Brown, of course, uh, being the guy introduced at, at the start of the talk. He is uh, the one who uh, was financially backed by uh, Samuel Gridley Howe and uh, Franklin Benjamin Sanborn in that failed insurrection in Harper's Ferry. Garrison introduced Fisk to John Brown in Boston in 1859, while Brown was making secret arrangements for his raid at Harper's Ferry. Holding Brown to be a true friend of the anti-slavery cause, Fisk contributed $100 to Brown's mission. And that's not adjusted for inflation. It was $100 um, in 1859. That's a lot of money. Um, John Zakos was another Greek-American abolitionist. John Zakos was 10 years old when he came to the United States under Dr. Samuel Grid uh, Gridley Howe's care. American Philhellenic patrons paid for the young boy's education and living expenses until he graduated in 1840. 
He spent most of his life as an educator and school principal. During the American Civil War, Zakos worked with the Educational Commission of Boston and New York, traveling to South Carolina in 1862 as part of the Union presence in the region. Zakos assisted with providing education to the newly freed slaves, a venture not dissimilar from the efforts made by benevolence groups for Greek education in the years that followed the revolution. Um, and this was the next stage in the Philhellenic movement where missionaries and education reformers um, led primarily by the efforts of Emma Willard, an advocate for female education in the US. They actually established uh, some of the first schools in Athens. A news report printed in a New York newspaper related the arrival of the Union forces, as well as the presence of three to 4,000 freed slaves who had assembled to celebrate Emancipation Day. The plentiful, the plentiful supply of abolition speeches included an ode written by John Zakos declaring African slaves finally free. Although the Greek cause initially aimed at helping the Greeks as an extension of philanthropic relief abroad. Ironically, in the end, it transformed American society. Both the rhetoric of the Greek cause and participation in the movement influenced reformers and brought a global perspective to the abolitionist movement. Though the consensus among Philhellenic organizations of the early 1820s was short-lived, the memory of the Greek cause continued to play a pivotal role in American reform through the 19th and into the early 20th centuries. Thank you. Dear Maureen, thank you so much. This was very, very rich and very illuminating talk and indeed groundbreaking research. Thank you so much for sharing with us your um, work. Um, let me ask, let, let me stay on art. Uh, I will ask the first question and then I will see the next questions that our audience has. Um, I, the Greek slave, just to uh, inform our audience, is going to be presented, presented in Greece at the Gennadius Library, Gennadius Library, an exhibit about American Philhellenism curated by the director Maria Giorgopoulou. So it's so nice that you gave us now a very good um, uh, overview about the history of this uh, piece. May I ask you, uh, I would like to stay more in art. Do we have more uh, pieces of art in America that uh, um, depict the, um, the Greek revolution or the Philhellenism of Americans as we have in Europe? In Europe, we have paintings and, uh, and literary poems, etc. Is there something more in America? So um, at least in the first half of the 19th century, not so much. That does change in the decades that follow. Um, you know, Americans were, they were kind of prudish. <laughs> um, they, they uh, like I said, I mean, the Greek slave is the first nude statue the, put on public display. And frankly, the only reason why, you know, again, it, it was okay uh, to put on public display is because of the subject subject matter, because the Philhellenic movement had been so popular. And so um, reviews that I didn't, I didn't mention in my talk, but reviews talk about the Greek slave as, even though she's nude, she's clothed in her morality, she's clothed in her faith. And so th that was acceptable. Um, art, um, it, it, it's kind of slim pickings. Um, we we do well. For example, Edward Everett uh, travels in Europe. He uh, uh, got his his PhD um, uh, studying in Germany, and he helped to bring a panorama of Athens to Boston. Um, and it was, that arrival was such a big deal because again, there just wasn't a lot of European art. Um, in the United States. And sadly, that piece was uh, destroyed in a fire. So um, we really don't have much. And Americans, unless they travel to Europe, would, would have been unfamiliar. So that's what made the Greek slave all the more impactful. Right, right. And we're looking forward to see it uh, uh, yeah, in, at the library, the Yanadius Library. Please join, come in Greece. Hopefully the pandemic will be over, so you will visit Greece and see that too. I have a question by, by my colleague Paris Aslanidis, who is a lecturer at the Hellenic Studies program. Uh, I will read this for you, uh, Maureen. A brilliant presentation. 
Uh, I wonder whether white Philhellenism was accompanied by Christian Philhellenism. In other words, how important do you think the anti-Muslim element was among American Philhellenes? Yeah, so it, it absolutely goes hand in hand with it. Um, uh, Philhellenic rhetoric was predominantly used in church sermons. Uh, raising funds was uh, definitely an extension of um, uh, religious life in the United States. Um, although, I, I, again, we have to consider not just the religious element, but this, this link, this you know, perceived link with ancient Greece that Americans believe they had, because there were other revolutions then taking place that did not attract the same inspiration as did the Greek revolution. So like the Serbian revolution, for example, it does not generate the same interest. Uh, there was some interest in um, like Simone Bolivar's uh, revolution, um, but again, not the same scale as uh, the, the Greek um, revolution. So yes, the answer is yes to that, but I, we have to look at, at both of them. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this would be actually my next question, but I think we answered how the American support to Greeks, to the Greek revolution is related uh, or is compared with the American support to other revolutions, but you just said that uh, it is much less, let's say the Latin America or the um, Serbian yeah. or... Yeah, so, um, and there was this feeling that uh, they, they would like to see republicanism spread throughout the world. Um, we certainly see those ideas reflected in newspapers of the time. But again, um, I mean, it is, when you look at the source material, the uh, support for the Greek revolution, I mean, it, it's just overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Throughout the 1820s, I, if you look at a newspaper, um, I, there's going to be at least one article in there saying something about the Greek revolution. Um, and again, yes, there, there's an interest in, you know, the, the uh, Venezuelan revolution, the Serbian revolution, and we do see uh, common elements there. But uh, because of not just the whiteness and the religious element, it's that ancient, the perceived ancient link to ancient Greece that Americans believe they had too. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Uh, my colleague George Sirimis, the director of the Hellenic Studies, has a question. I will read this for you and for our audience. Thank you for this rich and fascinating analysis of American Philhellenism. My question has to do with the application of the term slave to the Greeks under Ottoman rule. The institution of slavery to the extent and forms that it was practiced by the Ottoman was radically different from the racially based American case. Was there any clarification at the time of the differences? And do you think we should be using the term Greek slaves somewhat tentatively? Yeah, so in the source material, uh, no, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they absolutely use uh, the term Greek slaves. Uh, there, there didn't seem to be any sort of recognition of um, what exactly slavery was within the Ottoman Empire. I mean, of course, I, it, it, the Greeks were not held as slaves. Um, uh, in, uh, you, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. I, prior to the revolution, I mean, they're a protected minority group, I mean, within the Ottoman Empire, they're not enslaved. But um, the uh, within the United States, even before the Greek Revolution, this perspective that um, because the Greeks are living under Ottoman rule, and they uh, uh, perceive the Ottomans as the, the ultimate example of despotism. I'm sorry, about my four year old trying to crash the talk now. Um, so they don't, there is no distinction made in, um, in the uh, talk or Gabrielle. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, this is my world in, in, in COVID. Um, but um, I do agree that uh, in the scholarship, uh, we need to be tentative with using the term Greek slaves. Um, I certainly, in my book, um, I, I, try to point that out whenever possible. Um, but again, it's, it's like you're, you're trying to present the source material as early Americans understood it, while also trying to bring alongside it, like, you know, 
this is not actually in reality how slavery was within the Ottoman Empire. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. May I change slightly the topic? I know you worked also on women, um, uh, Maureen, and your first article was on the women's support. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the role of women to the Philhellenic movement here? Yeah, so um, women initially are not involved in a humanitarian effort at the start of the, the war, although the, the American Philhellenic movement was not a humanitarian effort right away in 1821 and 1822. This changes by 1823 when um, it, it turns out that the American government is not going to acknowledge Greek independence. They were more focused on uh, this commercial uh, trade aspect with the Ottoman Empire. So James Monroe comes out in his famous uh, State of the Union address where he articulates the Monroe Doctrine. Um, he actually says in this speech, the United States isn't gonna acknowledge Greek independence, um, but we wish them luck. Americans were taken aback. They expected that they would be supporting the Greek revolution. So it's at that moment we see a shift towards humanitarian efforts. And then this becomes more appropriate for women to have an active part in uh, the support of the Greeks because it was an extension of the benevolence movement. So supporting civilians in Greece is linked then with the support of, uh, of you know, the poor and destitute in the United States. So um, from there, I mean, women actually uh, like, in some cases went door to door asking for funds. Uh, women held like sewing circles. Uh, and again, in, new, in the newspapers, this is reported nationally, thousands of items of clothing are sewn by women um, and sent with these uh, uh, Philhellenic agents to Greece. That then translates into support for, and I mentioned this briefly, uh, support for the uh, opening of Greek schools in uh, Greece, the belief that uh, an education system was a method for uplifting the Greek population from its, uh, you know, again, its, its enslavement um, or its subjugation under the Ottoman rule. Um, so there are uh, huge efforts at that. I mean, American women actually went over with missionaries and became teachers. Um, and then we also see, uh, once again, with the Greek slave, inspiring this notion that um, with the rights of women are uh, also uh, greatly limited within the United States. And um, the perception of women in the Ottoman Empire was equated to the harem, which you know, again, it's, a, it's an over-exaggeration, not really what the experience of women is in the Ottoman Empire or uh, within Greece. But the perspective informed by captivity tales, the Philhellenic movement, the idea that women suffered under Ottoman rule, and then women using that saying, well, is our situation in the United States that much freer? So we start to see, again, Philhellenic rhetoric making its appearance in the early stages of the women's rights movement. And, um, and, and it continues through the 19th century, in fact. Um, I think you mentioned these communities, the Philhellenic communities throughout uh, the country. And there is one in New Haven where we are located. And I think this is a women's community in New Haven. I don't know if you have seen it or if you have worked on that, but uh, this might be a good yeah, research project for us both, for the Hellenic program here and you. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, women's community in New Haven, Philhellenic community in New Haven. Um, as I said at the beginning of my introduction, you, uh, the, one of the very good, uh, great reviews your book received in Greece, in the Greek translations, that you worked on several uh, archives. Your sources are really um, uh, such a width of uh, breadth of, of uh, sources. Would you like to tell us a little bit more? Where did you find the material about the Philhellenic uh, uh, stuff you worked sure. on? Yeah. Um, so again, I suspect because the Philhellenic movement was so popular, um, it is uh, overwhelming in some cases, the material that was kept. Um, so yeah, there, there's lots of pamphlets um, and you can find 
uh, lots of different copies of that at these different archives. But probably one of the, the coolest things I found, and, and this, and me personally as a historian, I like to, to find prior resource material that is like directly linked with individuals that can tell us something about them personally, them being involved in uh, the movement. So uh, one thing I found in um, at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, as well as the Historical Society of New York, um, and actually also uh, the Antiqu uh, American Antiquarian Society too, they have uh, collections of receipts that were written for individual donors uh, you know, I mean, ranging from like just like a little tiny donation to big donations. Sometimes these receipts are, are accompanied with letters. So, uh, for example, there is, uh, and I'm just remembering off the top of my head, uh, one individual from uh, Stanton, Virginia, which at the time must have been just a rural <laughs> backwater. Um, he writes to Edward Everett, as he's of course recognizes this national leader of the Philhellenic movement. And he laments, there isn't a big uh, Philhellenic group out here in Stanton, but you know, I'm sending you this money, please make sure it gets to whoever it needs to go to in order for it to be put to the best use. And, um, and you know, like there are like children's groups raise money um, right down to uh, uh, barbers, uh, I found an example of barbers uh, donating money, like all of their earnings from one day were donated to the Greek cause. Uh, a fire brigade in DC donates money. So I mean, in this, so it, what I discovered is it's not even just that this is, you know, a bunch of elites who are familiar with Greek history. This resonated at uh, every level of American society. So that was an exciting thing to find all of those uh, pieces of paper. Thank you. This is very interesting. Yes, very nice. Uh, I think we answered the questions uh, of our audience. I don't see any more. Do you see? Maybe I don't think we. Uh, I was so thorough. I answered everybody's questions. <laughs> I think we're good to go. So uh, it's so interesting to me. You spoke about the American Philhellenes at the beginning of 19th uh, century. And I think you are another Philhellenic at the beginning of the 21st century, Maureen. <laughs> And Thanks. thank you so much for your good work and your research. And I have a qu last question. Um, what actually uh, uh, made you work on that project? And this is a question not only out of curiosity, uh, how uh, you were inspired to work on Philhellenism. It's not only to understand your trajectory of your career as a historian, but it's also important for us to know that um, our field, the modern Greek history and culture has a relevance internationally. Yes. So, so I would like to be in discuss with you. Yeah. So I'm, I, I am not Greek <laughs> um, at all. Uh, and I think uh, it, 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 some people are like, oh, are you, are, you, are you Greek at all? No, I'm, I'm actually Irish. Um, but I, I, my undergraduate studies were in uh, classics, um, predominantly Roman uh, stuff. Um, I had to make the decision if I was gonna do classics or, or history. Um, and it was a tough decision. I actually went to, to Greece for the first time in 2006 when I graduated from college. So this was like my, my trip to Europe before going to grad school. And um, I just, I, it was so amazing being in Greece and seeing all, those, all, all the sites uh, with my own eyes. And so it was a tough decision um, deciding to go with US history. But I decided I really wanted to look at the classical classical influence in early America. So my initial research was was more focused on uh, Roman uh, sources because the Roman sources are what influenced early America in the late 18th century. So my master's thesis was on public opinion articles written at the time of the first federal Congress. Um, and again, it's a very much Roman Republic heavy. But in doing more reading and research, there is this transition in the early 19th century towards more of an influence of the Greek. And so I, I wondered like, why, where is this transition coming from? And, and there's a number of factors in play. Uh, the discovery of um, you know, various antiquities, Elgin, the Elgin marbles, of course, inspires discussion. 
Um, but ultimately, it this brought me to uh, 1821 and uh, the Greek Revolution. And um, the, the, the source material was just so rich that it's, it, it's, it gave me my topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we can close with two comments I see here on our Q&A section by Maria Yorgopoulou, who is, as I said, is the curator, the director of the Yanadius Library and the curator of the exhibit on yes. American Philhellenism. So she says, congratulations and thank you. And the last question by Yanis Karas. Thank you, missed the outset, so please ignore if irrelevant. Uh, was there a widespread sense of the Greek Revolution being an offspring of the American Revolution? Yes. Um, in fact, that comparison was used uh, very heavily, um, linking the American Revolution to the Greek, uh, trying to inspire support because, um, you know, the Greeks are just trying to fulfill the same sort of ideals and promises that uh, Americans want. And uh, so th those allusions were used very, very heavily. In fact, um, if I could share one story, um, there was a ball put on in Philadelphia. Uh, they advertised for it as far away as, as New York. And um, the ball uh, was for the Greek cause, but they, it was like a costume ball. They, they dressed as uh, in, eight, in like revolutionary 18th century attire in this ball. So the, the ball itself was just sort of a representation of those two traditions coming together. That's fascinating. Is this included also in your book? I, I, I make reference to it in the book. Make yeah, reference, yes, yeah. Yes, and that yes. was a, a newspaper articles advertising for the ball. Very nice, very nice. And may I ask if uh, I am allowed to, what will be your next project? Will it be related with Greece? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> or not anymore <laughs> enough with covid um i mean like things have been kind of you know odd with how you know, like getting to archives and and what have you um i uh, there's a couple of projects that i'd i'd like to pursue one is actually looking at women's involvement in the creation of these schools in Athens. I would love to uh, learn more about that. Like how much involvement did women have? Uh, what kind of roles did, did they have? Um, uh, were they able to assume leadership positions? What kind of impact um, did they have on the uh, new Greek state? Um, did they have connections with uh, the Greek government? Um, so I'd love to pursue that. Um, so I'm looking into that. <laughs> Very nice. We're looking very forward to your next uh, project. And uh, thank you so much. As I said, I feel you are the modern Philhellene of the 21st century. <laughs> and uh, I would like to, to wish to you, Maureen, and to our audience, first of all, health, strength, creativity, and uh, see you soon again to our next event. Thank well, you and have a good afternoon, all of you. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye.